this is George Gilbert from Wikibon. Uh, we're back on the ground with Aman Neymat at uh, Demand Base. Hey. And we're having a really interesting conversation about building next gen enterprise applications. It's getting really deep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, let's look ahead a little bit. Sure. We've talked, we've talked in some detail about um, the foundation technologies. Right. And you've told me before that we have so much technology, you know, still to work with yeah. that is unexploited, that we don't need, you know, a whole lot of breakthroughs, but we should focus on customer needs that are unmet. Yeah. Let's talk about some problems yet to be solved, but that are customer facing with, as you have told me, existing technology. Right, it can solve. Yes. Um, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a lot of focus in, the, in selling the Silicon Valley about like scaling machine learning and investing in, you know, um, GPUs and what have you. But I think there's enough technology there. So where is the gap? The really gap is in in understanding how to build AI applications and how to monetize it because it is quite different than building traditional applications and has different characteristics. And I can, you know, so it's much more experimental in nature. Although, you know, with lean engineering, we've moved about towards iterative software development, for example. Like, for example, 90% of the time, I, you know, after 20 years of building software, I'm quite confident I can build software. But it turns out, in the world of data science and AI-driven or AI applications, um, you can't have that much confidence. It's it's a lot more like discovering molecules in pharma. So you have to experiment more often. The Elaborate. methods have to be discovered. There's more discovery and less engineering in the early stages. Is the discovery uh, centered on do you have the right data? Yeah, or, or are you measuring the right thing, right? Is you thought you were going to maximize work, the model to maximize revenue, but really maybe the the end function should be increasing engagement with the customer. So often we don't know the end f objective function or incorrectly guess the right or wrong objective function. And the only way to do that is to be able to build an end-to-end -end system in days and then iterate through the different models in hours and days as quickly as possible with the end goal and customer in This mind. is really fascinating because we were some of the research we're doing is on the really primitive capabilities of the sort of analytic data pipeline yes. where you know all the work that has to do with coming up with the features yeah. and then plugging that into um, a model and then managing the model's life cycle right. that those that whole process is so fragmented yeah and it's you know chewing gum and bailing wire. Sure. And I imagine that that slows dramatically that experimentation process. I mean, it slows it down, but it's also a mindset, right? Okay. So um, now that we have built, you know, we probably have 100 machine learning models now, uh, demand-based that, that I've contributed or built with our data scientists. And in the end, we have found out that you can actually do something in a day or two uh, with extremely small amount of data over using Python and SKLearn today very quickly that will give you and then you know build some simple UI that can a human can evaluate and give feedback or whatever action you're trying to to get to and get to that as quickly as possible rather than build, worrying about the pipelines rather than worry about everything else because in 80% of the cases it will fail anyways or you will realize that either you don't have the right data or Nobody wants it, or it can never be done, or you need to approach a completely different, from a completely different objective function. Let me parse what you, you what you've said in, in in a different way, and so sure. I see if I understand it. Um, traditional model building is based not on sampling, but on the full data set. That's right. And what you're saying in terms of That's experimentation Stop doing that. Yes. is to go back to samples. That's right. Go back to it. There's a misunderstanding that we need. You know, while demand-based processes close to a trillion rows of data today, we have found that 
almost all big data AI solutions can be initially proven with very small amounts of data and small amount of features. And if they don't work that, if you cannot have 100 rows of data and have a human look at some rows and make a judgment, then it's not possible, most likely, with 1 billion and with 10 billion. So if, if you cannot work it, now there are exceptions to this, but in 90% of the cases, if the solution is not at you know a few thousand or million rows of data, now the problem is that all the, the easy you know, libraries and open source stuff that's out there, it's all designed to be a workable in small amounts of data. So what we don't want to do is build this whole massive infrastructure, uh, which is getting easier, and worry about data pipelines and you know, putting it all together only to realize that this is not going to work, or more often, that it doesn't solve any problem. So if I were to sort of boil that down into terms of, in product terms, yeah. the notion that you could have something like Spark running on your laptop um, yeah. and scaling out to a big cluster. Yeah, um, just running on your laptop. That, yeah. In fact, you don't even need or, Spark. Or I was going to say, not even Spark, no. just use Python. Just Python, it's, it's scale learn is much better it's for almost something like, like this. It's, this is, so, so it's back to Visual Basic. You know, you're not going to build a production app. I wouldn't in Visual, go that far, but well, <laughs> it's a prototype. No, I meant for the, the the prototype GUI app. Yeah. You do in Visual Basic. Sure. And then you know when you're going to build a production one, you, That's you right. use Microsoft. Because most class often, or, yeah. Right. More often, you don't have the right data. You have the wrong objective function, or your customer is not happy with the results or wants to modify it. So, and that's true for conventional business applications, the old school, whatever, internet applications. But it is more true for here because it's much, the data is much more noisy, the, da the problems are much more complex. And ultimately, you need to be able to take real world action and, it, and so build something that could take the real world action, be it for a very narrow problem or use case, and get to it even without any model. And the mo first model that I recommend, or I do, or my data scientists do, is like, just do it yourself by hand. Just label the data and say, as if, like, let's pretend that this was the right answer and we can take this action and the workflow works, like, does do you, something good happen? You know, will it be something that would satisfy some problem? And if that's not true, then why build it? And you can do that manually, right? So it's, I guess it's no different than any other entrepreneurial un endeavor, but it's more true in data science projects Firstly, because they're more likely to be wrong than I think we have learned now how to build good software, imperative much software. imperative software. And, and, and data science is called data science for a reason. It's much more experimental, right? Like in science, you don't know. A negative experiment is a fine experiment. This is actually, of all, of all that we've been talking about, it might sound the most abstract, but it's also the, the most profound because right. what you're saying is um, this elaborate process yes. and the technology to support it, you know, this whole pipeline, um, that it's like you only do that once you've proven the prototype. That's right. And that and get the prototype in a day. You don't you don't want that elaborate structure no. and process um, when you're testing something out no yeah exactly and and you know like when we build our own machine learning models obviously coming out of academia you know we were there was a class project but it took us a year or six months to really design the best models and test it and prove it out intrinsic but uh, intrinsic testing and we knew it was working but what we should really have done which we do now is we build models we do experiments daily and get to, in essence, the patient with our molecule every day. So, you know, we have the advantage, given that we're in sales and marketing, that we can get to test our molecules of drugs on a daily basis. And we have enough data, data to test it, and we have enough customers, thankfully, to test it, and some of them are, are collaborating with us. So we get to 
and solution on a daily basis. So now I understand why you said we don't need these radical algorithmic breakthroughs or you know new super turbocharged turbocharged processors. So so with this approach of yeah. really fast prototyping, right? What are some of the unmet needs in yeah, that's a, you know that that it's just a matter of cycling through these experiments. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest unmet need today, we're able to understand language, we're able to predict who should you do business with and what should you talk about. But I think natural language generation or creating a personalized email, really personalized and really beautifully written, is still something that we haven't quite, uh, you know, had a full, have a full grasp on. And, and to be able to communicate at human level personalization, to be able to talk, you know, we can generate ads today, but that's not really, you know, language, right? It is language, but not as sophisticated as, as what we're talking here. Or to be able to generate text or have a bot speak to you, right? We can have a bot, we can now understand and respond in text, but really speak to it, to you fluently with context about you. Um, it's definitely an area where we're heavily investing in or are looking to invest in in the near future. And, and with existing technology. With existing technology. Huh. I think we think if we can narrow it down, we can generate uh, emails that are much better than what a salesperson would write. In fact, we, are, we already have a product that can personalize a website automatically using AI, reinforcement learning, and all the data we have. And it can rewrite a website to be customized for each visitor, personalized to each visitor. Give us an example of what. So, you know, for example, if you if you go to, to Cement or SAP and you come from Pharma, it will take you and surface different content about pharmaceutical. And, you know, in essence, at some point, you can generate a whole page that's personalized to if uh, somebody from comes to pharma from a CFO versus an IT person, it will change the entire page content, right, to that. So in essence, the entire buyer journey could be personalized because, you know, today, buying from B2B, it's quite jarring. It's filled with spam. It's, you know, it's not a pleasant experience. It's not concierge level experience. And really, in an ideal world, you want B2B or marketing to be personalized. You want it to be like you're being you know, guided through. If you need something, you can ask a question, and you have a personalized assistant talking to you about it. So that there's, the, the journey is not coded in. And yeah. the, the journey or the conversation response reacts to the, to the customer. To the customer. Right. And, and, and B2B buyers want, you know, they want something like that. They don't have time to waste towards, who wants to be lost on a website? Right. You know, you go to any Fortune 500 company's website, and you—it's just a mess. Okay, so let's let's um, back up to the demand base in a, in the Bay Area software ecosystem. Sure. So Salesforce is a big company. Yes. Marketing is one of their pillars. Yes. Tell us what is it about this next gen technology? that is so, we, we touched on this before, but so anathema to the way traditional uh, software companies build uh, yeah. their products. I mean, Salesforce are, is a very close partner. They're a customer. We, we work with them very closely. Um, I think they're also an investor, a small investor for demand base. We have a deep relationship with them. Um, and I myself come from the traditional software background. You know, I've been building CRM, so I'll talk about myself because I've seen how different and my, you know, I have to sort of transition at a very early stage from a human-centric CRM to a data-driven CRM or human-driven versus data-driven. And it's, you have to think about things differently. So one difference is that when, when you look at data in, in a human-driven CRM, you, can, you trust it implicitly because somebody in your org put it in. You may challenge it. It's old, it's stale, but there's no, there's no fear that it's a machine recommending you and driving you. And it requires the interfaces to be much different. You have to think about how do you build trust between the person 
you know, who's being driven in a Tesla, also a similar problem. And, you know, how do you give them the controls so they can turn off the autopilot, right? And how do you, you know, take feedback from humans to improve the models? Um, so it's a, it's a different way. The human interface even becomes more different and simpler. The other interesting thing is, is that if you look at traditional applications, they're quite complicated. They have all these fields because you're going to just enter all this data and, 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 and you type it in. But the way you interact with our applications is we already know everything or a lot. So why bother asking you? We already know where you are, where, who you are, what you should do. So we are, in essence, guiding you more of a, again, using the Tesla autopilot example. It already knows where you are. It knows you're sitting in the car. And it knows that you need to brake because you know you you're gonna crash. So it'll just brake by itself. So you know the oh, interface is really an interesting <coughs> analogy. Mm -hmm. Tesla is a data-driven piece of software, it is. whereas you know my old BMW right. or whatever is a human-driven piece of software. Software, and there's some things in the middle. So and you can you know I recently have been looking at cars. I just had a baby and. Volvo is something in the middle <coughs> where if you're going to have an accident or somebody comes close, it blinks. So it's like advanced analytics, right, which yeah. is an analogous to that. Tesla just stops if you're going to have an accident. And that's the right idea. Because if I'm going to have an accident, you don't want to rely on me to s look at some light. What if I'm talking on the phone or looking at my kid? Right. You know, some blinking light over there, which is why advanced analytics is hasn't been as successful as it should be. Because the, the, the handoff between the data-driven and the human-driven is a very difficult It's handoff. a very difficult handoff. Okay. And whenever possible, the right answer for us today is if you know everything and you can take the action, like if you're going to have an accident, just stop. Or if you need to go, go, right? So if you come out in the morning, you know, and you go to work at 9 a.m., Just it should just pull out, put itself out. Like, you know, why wait for human to, you know, get rid of all the monotonous problems that we ourselves have, right? That's a great example. On that note, let's break. And uh, this is George Gilbert. I'm with um, and having a, a great conversation with Aman Nimat, senior VP and CTO of Demandbase, and uh, we will be back shortly with uh, a member of the data science team. Thank you, George.